Boileau Prison was first built during the French colonial era between 1886 and 1901 in the French quarter of Hanoi, Vietnam's capital city. During this time, Vietnam was part of French Indochina, a group of French colonial territories in Southeast Asia, which was eventually dissolved in the 1950s. As well as various Vietnamese regions, French Indochina consisted of Cambodia, Laos, and Guangzhou Wen. The city of Hanoi remained the area's capital between 1902 and 1945. Upon first being built, Hua Lo Prison was dubbed Maison Centrale, or Central House, and was established to hold Vietnamese revolutionaries and political dissidents, particularly those campaigning for Vietnamese independence. The prison had a grisly reputation from the start. Prisoners were known to be subject to torture and brutal interrogation tactics before finally facing execution. The name Hua Lo emerged sometime afterwards, roughly translating to stove, fire kiln, or fiery furnace, and came from the fact that the surrounding neighborhood was filled with stores selling wood and coal fire stoves. In 1913, the prison was renovated, allowing it to grow its capacity from 460 inmates to 600, although it continued to be overcrowded, often holding as many as 730 prisoners in the subsequent years. By 1922, it held 895 prisoners, and 11 years later, that figure rose to 1,430. By the mid-1950s, Hua Lo Prison had more than 2,000 inmates. It had long since gained a reputation not just for its brutal violence against political protesters, but also for its inhumane conditions. It quickly became a symbol of colonialist exploitation. In this episode, we will explore how the destabilization of Vietnam into the Vietnam War led to some of the most horrific conditions for prisoners of war in modern history. Welcome to Wars of the World. By the late 1940s, France was struggling to control its Indochina colonies. In 1945, it attempted to re-establish itself in Indochina, but four years later, Laos became independent, and Cambodia followed suit in 1953. And though France promised autonomy to Vietnam by 1949, it would only do so in a strict and limited capacity, which led to much civil unrest. While financially the French were assisted by the US, Nationalists were sparking uprising in great numbers, and the country and its citizens were becoming more and more difficult to pacify. Then, in 1954, the collapse of French Indochina came when the French-held garrison at Dien Bien Phu, Vietnam, fell. A siege had started four months earlier, led by Vietnamese nationalist Ho Chi Minh. Once the stronghold had crumbled, the French pulled out of the region. Their departure led the US to express fears that communism, America's biggest fear at the time, would spread throughout what was left of Indochina and have a domino effect on the rest of the world. The domino theory, which was a Cold War policy, suggested that if one communist government came to power in one country, it would lead to similar governments taking over other nations, having a knock-on effect and leading to these countries falling like a row of dominoes. Although this theory has long since been debunked, US President Dwight Eisenhower used this rhetoric to justify the country's involvement in the Vietnam War, which subsequently raged between November 1955 and April 1975. Following the defeat of the French in July 1954, France, Vietnam, the US and China all met in Geneva to establish a plan for Indochina moving forwards. During this conference, now known as the Geneva Accords, several things were agreed upon. The first was that the French and Vietnamese agreed to a ceasefire and a temporary division of the country, splitting it into the north and south. The French would stay in the latter, while Ho Chi Minh's men would control the north. The second agreement was that neither half of the country would join up with outside parties. It was also stipulated that elections would be held within two years in 1956, which would unify Vietnam under one democratic government, and that Laos and Cambodia were to remain neutral. 
The 1956 elections, however, never took place. Notably, the US didn't sign the second agreement. It established its own government in Vietnam, and after the French pulled out of the country, they appointed a leader for South Vietnam. The man they'd chosen, No Jing Jam, was unpopular, as he was known to have avoided the struggles of Vietnamese nationalists by temporarily moving abroad. Although Jem was known to have worked and cooperated with the Japanese, it was reportedly his devout Catholicism which had appealed to US officials. In 1959, North Vietnam began building a supply route through Laos and Cambodia to South Vietnam. It was designed to support guerrilla attacks against the South's government, and it was eventually dubbed the Ho Chi Minh Trail and became an important passage as the Vietnam War escalated. This same year, the first US soldiers were killed in the South after guerrilla soldiers raided their living quarters. For several years, the US stayed in the background during the war. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy sent in helicopters and Green Berets to South Vietnam. And seven months later, at the beginning of 1962, US aircraft began deploying Agent Orange to ruin the vegetation that would offer food and cover for guerrilla forces in South Vietnam. Meanwhile, the US's chosen leader, Jem, continued to decline in popularity. In 1963, he opened fire on a crowd of Buddhist protesters in the city of Hue, killing eight people. Buddhists continued to protest, leading to one of the most well-known images of the Vietnam War, that of a monk, Thich Quang Duc, setting himself on fire in Saigon in 1963. The US then backed a South Vietnam military coup against Jem but it ended violently when Jem and his brother were killed. In 1964, however, the US became heavily involved in the Vietnam War, following the attack of USS Maddox. This led President Lyndon Johnson to call for airstrikes against patrol boat bases in North Vietnam. Numerous American pilots were apprehended between 1965 and 1968 during Operation Rolling Thunder, the name given to the US's sustained aerial bombardment campaign against Vietnam. A bombing pause was then initiated by President Lyndon, during which time the number of abductions was significantly reduced. However, they picked up again in 1969, when President Richard Nixon continued bombing the country. Pilot Everett Alvarez Jr. was the first US prisoner to be sent to Wallow Prison in 1964, dubbed the Hanoi Hilton by American prisoners of war. From the very beginning, conditions for prisoners were unsavory at best. Food was virtually inedible and conditions were unsanitary, with cells being unventilated and often being infested by rats. Some POWs were chained for days at a time and not allowed to use the toilet, and starvation and dehydration were both rampant. In 1965, torture against US prisoners began to be doled out to the extremes. During the first six years in which US prisoners were being held in Vietnam, many were sentenced to extended periods of solitary confinement, mostly to prevent communication with one another. One senior US officer, Robinson Rincer, was held in solitary for three years. Similarly, the Alcatraz Gang, the name given to a group of 11 POWs who held strong resistance to their captors, were also placed separately both from one another and other prisoners. They were placed in a special facility dubbed Alcatraz, in an area beyond the North Vietnamese Ministry of National Defense, about a mile from Hoa Lo Prison. They were shackled with leg cuffs every night in a three foot by nine foot windowless concrete cell with a light on for 24 hours a day. James Stockdale is given particular credit by his fellow prisoners of war, being described as the strongest, most exemplary leader of the whole North Vietnam POW environment. While in Alcatraz prison, he was known to have attempted to take his own life so that he couldn't be forced to make a propaganda film. Though his suicide attempt failed, the film was never made. He would later be awarded the Medal of Honor and passed away in 2005. While prisoners in Hua Lo continued to suffer from malnutrition, torture grew more horrific over time. Despite the fact that North Vietnam had signed the Third Geneva Convention of 1949, which stipulated that prisoners of war be given decent and humane treatment. Prison officials frequently used waterboarding, irons, beatings, lengthy bouts of solitary confinement, and strapos, which the POWs called the ropes, and which saw victims' hands tied behind their backs before they were suspended by a rope attached by the wrist. This often resulted in dislocated shoulders, and sometimes even broke ribs. Weights were even sometimes added to make the punishment more severe, Injured POWs were not exempt from the next round of abuse. Torture was not generally done to acquire information, but to break the spirit of the prisoners, 
both individually and as a group. Many attribute learning tap code to their ability to survive. Tap code was introduced by four POWs in 1965, who recalled the code from prior training and taught it to the other prisoners. It was easy to learn and could be taught without speaking. Not only did this allow POWs to communicate through walls, but they also tapped on one another's bodies when they were in the same room but not allowed to speak. The code became instrumental in keeping up morale. Another aim of the North Vietnamese was to get written or recorded statements of propaganda, the kind James Stockdale had attempted to avoid by trying to take his own life. These propaganda pieces would involve US soldiers criticizing their own government and military for how it handled the war while singing the praises of North Vietnam and how it treated its prisoners. The Vietnamese hoped that this propaganda would swing opinion, both domestically and internationally, against the US. In one such instance in 1966, a Navy pilot named Jeremiah Denton was taken to a televised press conference and made to appear. Here Denton famously spelt out torture using his eyes with Morse code, confirming to US authorities that POWs were being treated poorly in North Vietnam. Things grew worse for many of the POWs later that year, when 52 prisoners were taken through the streets of Hanoi with numerous guards and paraded in front of Vietnamese civilians. Before long, however, chaos broke out when civilians began assaulting the prisoners and beating them. Worse yet, there was not enough guards to restrain the attacks. Many of these American prisoners were subject to years of vicious and violent assault and torture while in Vietnam. One such prisoner, who later became a senator, John McCain, wrote about the time he'd been forced to make anti-American propaganda, stating, quote, I had learned what we all learned over there. Every man has his breaking point. I had reached mine. End quote. McCain's fighter bomber had been hit on October 26th, 1967, and while ejecting from his aircraft, he broke both arms and a knee. He was found in a lake in Hanoi by the Vietnamese, who subsequently beat him and stabbed him, breaking his shoulder. He was interrogated by guards, who continued to strike his already broken bones. Dealing with fever and dysentery, he was eventually delivered to a camp known as The Plantation. This camp was described as being a propaganda showplace for foreign visitors, intended to make the Vietnamese look better, as prisoners were treated more humanely here, and physical assaults occurred much less frequently. The plantation was also used to prepare prisoners who were to be released. Another POW named George Day recalled the first time he laid eyes on McCain, stating, quote, When I got him, he was absolutely on the verge of death. His right arm was broken. His left arm had been pulled out of the socket. His right knee had been fractured and cut on. He had been bayoneted. He weighed somewhere between 95 and 105 pounds. He was filthy rotten stinking. You could smell him 15 or 20 feet away. They had battered and tortured him. I had no doubt they could dump him on me so they could say he died in the care of an American. It was fascinating to watch him fight back. His body was telling him, we're going to die. His brain was saying, the hell we are. End quote. Few US POWs were able to withstand the torture they'd been subjected to without breaking. One example being John Arthur Dramesia, a US Air Force colonel who spent time in Hualo Prison and Ku Lok Prison, the latter of which was dubbed the Zoo. Dramesia refused to cooperate with the Vietnamese during his time in capture and never made any pieces of propaganda while apprehended. Luckily, Dramesia survived his ordeal, while several others like him, including Edwin Atterbury, did not. It became understood among POWs that they must first undertake as much physical punishment as they could before cooperating. New arrivals were told, quote, Take physical torture until you are right at the edge of losing your ability to be rational. At that point, lie, do, or say whatever you must to survive. But you must first take physical torture. End quote. POWs would also subsequently tell one another what they had revealed after making statements or other propaganda for the Vietnamese as a way to avoid becoming vulnerable and weighed down by negative emotions like shame or guilt for what they had revealed. Many, even after release, were obsessed with their own betrayals and found it difficult to forgive themselves. In late 1969, however, the Vietnamese torture regime appeared to subside. This led prisoners living a more tolerable life while incarcerated. Notably, in early September 1969, Ho Chi Minh had died from heart failure. There is some speculation that his death led to new leadership who changed their policy on the treatment of POWs.
It has also been suggested that when President Nixon publicized the poor treatment of US soldiers in Vietnam, it caused officials in Vietnam to rethink their strategy, as they were looking to appeal for sympathy and gain public favor. Even still, by 1971, an estimated 30 to 50 percent of prisoners of war had become discouraged due to a lack of progress by the military. Morale had been boosted the year before, when a failed rescue attempt led many to realize that the government was attempted to bring them home, and not just leaving them to languish in North Vietnamese prison for the rest of their life. Furthermore, a byproduct of this rescue attempt was that many POWs were being moved to Hua Lo Prison, where instead of being put into single-windowed, single-person cells, they were put into large rooms filled with around 70 men each. The increased human contact served to boost the morale further. In 1973, President Nixon signed the Paris Peace Accords. This led to the end of US involvement in the Vietnam War, with North Vietnam accepting an immediate ceasefire. Over the next few months, prisoners of war were finally released. Operation Homecoming, which took place between February and April, saw the return of 591 prisoners. By the end of the war in 1975, it was estimated that around 58,220 Americans were killed, while Vietnam estimated that around 1.1 million Vietnamese and Viet Cong fighters were killed, along with 250,000 South Vietnamese soldiers and over 2 million civilians. North Vietnam was never charged by the US or its allies with war crimes, following the war's end and implementation of the Paris Peace Accords. Since the 2000s, the Vietnamese government has maintained that claims of POWs being tortured were fabricated, adding that their prisons were no worse than those in South Vietnam. Other Vietnamese witnesses, including jailers and a North Vietnamese army colonel, also claimed that no torture had occurred, their accounts directly conflicting those of released US soldiers. Many of these POWs would go on to write books about their horrific experiences, detailing what went on inside Hoa Lo Prison, along with other camps. The lengthy list of wrongdoings carried out by the North Vietnamese jailers, including the likes of murder, beatings, broken bones, burst eardrums, broken and removed teeth, dislocated limbs, starvation, serving food contaminated with human and animal waste, and medical neglect of infections and disease. Hoa Lo Prison continued to be used following the release of US POWs. It wasn't until the mid-1990s that most of the prison was demolished. Today, part of the site contains two high-rise apartment buildings. Part of the prison, however, remains, and has since been converted into a museum. While the displays mostly show the prison as it was during the French colonial period, there are some remnants of the Vietnam War, including a display of John McCain's flight suit and parachute. McCain, for his part, wrote his own book about what he suffered during the Vietnam War. Upon his return to the US in 1973, he seemed to adapt quickly to normal life, but was struggling beneath the surface. His brother Joe recalled, quote, But every now and then he fell really quiet. John had always been a guy constantly in motion. Social motion, verbal motion, mental motion. Partying, arguing, fussing, having fun, being a pilot. Now he seemed to be focusing on who he was, as opposed to just living in the moment. I got the feeling that what had changed in him was that the experience had taken what was inside of him and condensed it, tempered it like steel. He was a lot more reflective. He came out looking more forward and more backward. It all made him think about that inner gyroscope, that compass." End quote. McCain, like many of his fellow POWs, considered himself a prisoner for some time after his release, bound by his own guilt, mental anguish, and nightmarish memories. Orson Swindle, another US POW, noted, quote, he was obsessed and tortured by guilt. We all were. To this day, I get angry with myself, but we did the best we could, and he realizes over time that we all fall short of what we aspire to be, and that is where forgiveness comes in.